as I was saying, he had a, I got a phone call about 4.30 p.m. asking me if this Chabad of Windsor Terrace. I said, yes, it is. He said, well, we have, we looked you up. You seem to be the nearest synagogue to a gentleman who lost his mother and looking to make a minion to say Kaddish in their house. I don't know who this person was. And the ways they said, you're a six minute drive away. I said, six minute drive away, we're in Brooklyn. How can I be the nearest? But be that as it may, it happened, so happened to be that I actually was the nearest uh, Chabad rabbi around in the in the vicinity. And uh, thank God we were able to make them a minion, not for me, but I was there, helped make the minion for a uh, Jew who quite obviously to me did not have much of a Jewish background, a Jewish education. And uh, the people that came there were Hasidim, from Borough Park, the Carlin group, they came and they helped to make a minion. One of them knew this gentleman, um, the mourner from work, and uh, they reached out to us. But uh, we're on the map, and they reached out to us because uh, they felt that we can help them, and we did in our own little way, and hopefully this will have a continued uh, uh, good effect on this gentleman, that God should comfort him, and he will be able to uh, attend services and uh, bring a elevation for his mother's soul, I didn't ask. Okay, but directly connected with the subject we're going to talk about, and that is this today, Tuesday is exactly one week from Gimel Tammuz, the third of Tammuz, which would mark the 30th Yom Hilula of the Lubavit Shudah, righteous memory. Now, what we're going to talk about today is very Kabbalistic. We're going to talk a lot of Kabbalah. We're going to read from the Kabbalah, from the Zohar. And basically what we're going to discover over here is what is the whole idea of going to the graveside of a tzaddik and prank? What's the whole idea of going to the Rebbe's Ohel, the Davin at the Rebbe's Ohel? We begin in Jewish history, in the book of Genesis. The first um, person to bury was Avraham buries his wife, Sarah. He buys the first real estate transaction ever recorded. He purchases the cave of Machpelah. And he buries his wife Sarah there. And then Avram himself is buried there. Yitzchak is buried there. Rebecca, Rivka is buried there. And then we have something interesting. Yaakov is married to multiple wives. And his love of his life, Rachel, passes. And Yaakov decides, instead of burying Rachel, taking with her, with him, to Hebron, to the family plot, so to speak, and burying her, in what would be his wife's plot. So he should be buried next to his wife. He decides to bury her right on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. And the obvious question we have to ask ourselves is, why would Yaakov do this to his wife? Why would Jacob bury his wife in the middle of nowhere? His father and mother were buried together. His grandparents were buried together. And he had a family plot. He had a plot for her. The plot ends up being that his wife Leah gets buried there. But he could have buried the love of his life for a little bit of a schlep. So you can't do this for the love of your life. You can't do a little schlep. She didn't give you enough in life. I mean, what, what's going on? Something seems very, very disturbing about this at first glance. So we have to give a look and we look further into the commentaries and the commentaries explain that this was done purposefully. It was intentionally. There was great reason for this. What could possibly be the reason why a gentleman would take his wife and bury her on the side of his road, on the side of the road? And for that, we look in the Medrash. And the Medrash tells us, but Thomas Rachel, Rachel dies, but he covered Ephras, and she was buried on the road to Ephrat. What in the world did Jacob see to bury his wife on the road to Ephrat? Jacob foresaw that the Jewish exiles would pass there on the Jewish, and when the Jews were exiled, they would be traveling on this road. Therefore, he buried her right at that strategic location. So that she would be able to beg for mercy for them. As the verse states, a voice is heard on high. Lamentation, bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children. This is, is it specifically the exiles? Yeah. Yeah. 
So what's the reason why Yaakov buries her there? So that she should be able to evoke God's mercy. It says Rashi on the book of Genesis, so that she would be a help to her, her descendants. The Jews would be passing there, and Rachel would cry out from her tomb, and beseech God's mercy. And what does God respond to Rachel's plea? There is reward for your efforts, says God. Your children will return to their borders. God promises Rachel that because of her prayers to speak on their behalf, Jews will return to Israel once again. So this is the first time that we have, if we pause the frame right here, we stop and we see, why did Jacob bury Rachel on the side of the road? For one reason. So that Jews would pass her burial plot in their time of need. And in their time of need, they would turn to Rachel. And what would Rachel do for them? She would be able to arouse God's mercy. She would be able to elicit from God the proper response, which is the exile will end. There will be an end date and they will return back to their home. This is fascinating. Fascinating. So Rachel is still buried there. Rachel is still buried in the middle of nowhere today. So that the Jews have a place to go in their time of need. Unbelievable sacrifice that Rachel gives up her spot in Hebron just to be able to stay connected. This is what we would call a Yiddish mama. This is what a, a Yiddish mama, only a Yiddish mama does such a thing. Only a Jewish mother sacrifices to such a degree for her children. Last week we learned in the Parsha the story of Moses sending the 12 spies. Right? What was the story of the 12 spies? Moshe Rabbeinu sends the 12 spies. And he gave, a gave a negative report. Two come back with a positive report. Of the two that come back with a positive report, we have to ask the obvious question. We know, every one of us know, that the greatest pressure in life is peer pressure. There is nothing that is more dangerous than peer pressure. It is when everyone in the classroom, when everyone in the group, when everyone in the city is up to something, how do you manage the courage to stand up and say, no, I'm not participating with you? You're going to be called the nerd, the loser, the goody-goody, whatever it is. So we have to ask, how did these two remain kosher, we'll call them? How did they not caught up, get caught up in the plot of the spies? And we see the answer for one of them clearly in the Torah. And that is Joshua. Moses changes his name before he sends him. He changes his name from Hoshea to Yehoshua Yadzeyud. Why? So that Moses prays that God should protect you from the plot of the spies. So that's one. What about the other one? How does Kolev ben Yifuna stay righteous? How does he remain kosher? And for that, the Talmud says, the reason how Kolev stayed righteous, whose Kolev saw what was happening. When he went and they made their way to Israel, he heard the way they were speaking. It's not, it wasn't difficult to pick up on what their agenda was. And Kolev made a quick detour. Because Kolev knew that there was one place in Israel. There was only one place in Israel that time that was holy. And what was that place? Hebron. Why was the place holy? Because Bobby and Zaydi are there. Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov are there. Let me go there to pray. So Kolev takes a detour to Hebron. The Talmud says, Makshim, they ask, which should have said, and they came, not and he went up. I'm sorry. It should have said, and they came, not that they went up. Rav says, the teacher just, why is the singular language? says, and they went up, and he came to Hebron. It should have said, and they went up, and they went to Hebron. Rather, this teaches us that it was only one person who went to Hebron. Kolev went on his own, and what did he do? He prostrated himself on the graves of the forefathers, and he said to them, Avoisai, my forefathers, pray for me, and not sell me atzas meragam, that I be saved from the plot of the spies. And that's exactly what happens. 
Because of this, Kalev remains righteous, and God rewards Kalev with the city of Hebron. And this remains a place where Jews go to pray till this very day in Hebron. Till this very day, as we're talking right now, as you're listening to this and watching this, Jews are in Hebron praying at the holy resting place of our forefathers. There's only one problem today, and that is that the Israeli government does not allow us, Jews, to enter into the entire place. We have only permission to visit certain of our patriarchs. Avram Avinu, we can't go to. Abraham, we can't get to. I think Isaac, I don't think we can get to. Yaakov, Jacob, we can get to. Leah, we can get to. Um, but we can't go to, into the entire place. Didn't you, didn't you go there when you I went, yeah, I was just there. Yeah, yeah, I showed you. You can't go everywhere. You can't get everywhere. The Muslims have control of over, uh, sadly, over part of our our real estate. It's our real estate. The first real estate. Uh, we could do this even yeah. without the Mashiach, by the way. We don't need the Mashiach. The Mashiach should come and take care of the problem. But this is a very big travesty that what Avraham bought and remained in Jewish hands till this very day, the Israeli government doesn't allow us to go there. But be that, that's as a side note. The point we're trying to make over here is how you see in history how Jews went and prayed at the resting place of the dead. And the question is, how does this work? How does this process work? You go there and you pray. What exactly is going on when you go there? And for this, we have to open up the book of Zohar. We have to read from the Zohar. And the Zohar explains to us how there is a spiritual connection that's being made. And these are actually part of what we're going to read now is actually inserted into the book called the Ma'an Eloshan. The Ma'an Eloshan is a book that we read at the Ohel. It's as a, it's a compilation of a number of different places of Tehillim and prayers and Zohar, and the section the Zohar that we read is what we're going to read now. The Zohar states as follows. This is from the Zohar on the portion of Achrei Mos. When the world needs mercy and the living suffer, the people pray at the grave sites, and they in turn inform those who sleep in Hebron, meaning the patriarchs, and they awaken and enter the lower Gan Eden, where the Ruach of the righteous dwell. Let's stop there for a moment. What does it mean, the Ruach of the Righteous? So let's talk a little soul language. Kabbalah explains that every single person, every single Jew is made up of a body and a soul. The body, what the body is made up of, when you look at someone, you think you see it. You don't see much. You see skin covering bones. But there's a lot beneath the skin. There's a lot of stuff that's going on. When you take a scan of the body with modern day technology, you see a lot more. When you do have to do got to be a surgery, you open up and you see a lot more. There are many levels and layers to the body. And similarly, there are many levels and layers to the soul. There are five layers or levels of soul. Three of these levels actually rest within, are invested within the body. And two of them remain outside of the body. The three levels, the lowest level is called nefesh. The nefesh would mean soul. After that, a higher level, a deeper level of soul would be called ruach, spirit. A higher level than that would be called nishama. These are the three lower levels. The two higher levels are called chaya, life or living and then there is yechido yechido means the oneness that's the essence of the soul if you will the core of the soul which is directly connected with almighty god so what did he say he said when the world is in trouble and we need mercy so the living go to pray at the gravesite of the righteous the righteous then in turn go and wake up the patriarchs in Hebron, who then go to Gan Eden and they wake up the Ruach level of the, of, of the righteous and they take counsel with them. Issue decrees for the benefit of humanity and God grants their desire and has pity on the world. We're in the middle of source number four. 
The level of the soul which remains in this world to protect the living is called nefesh. It does not depart from this world, but abides in the world to watch and know what takes place and to protect its generation. It is with regard to nefesh that we are told that the dead know the sorrows of the world. So let's break this down for a moment. And if you will, to understand this, we'll understand that at the resting place of any individual, besides for the physical remains that are there, there is also the lowest level of soul, which if you will, would be the interface while we're living between body and spirit, whatever it is, the life force that animates us that we call loosely soul, that how does the soul give life to the body? That's the nefesh. When you die, the nefesh remains right next to your body. It's not giving you life anymore into your body, but the nefesh remains connected right there. And there's always a part today we would call a DNA. You can always extract DNA. If you bury someone, even if the body is long disintegrated, you can always get what we call now their DNA. Well, that fingerprint, that DNA, that, re that whatever it is that we would know, that's connected with the nefesh of the person, the soul of the person, the lowest level of soul, which remains there. So there's a soul connection whenever you go to a grave. There's a, there's a soul connection being made. So how does the process work? We go to the to the righteous, right? His nefesh, the, the 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 nefesh of the righteous is present there. So if you want to connect with a tzaddik, if you want to connect with with the soul of the righteous, you can connect with the soul of the righteous by going to the graveside because their nefesh is present over there, and from there they in turn go to the patriarchs, and from there they inform the level of ruach, a higher level of so, and then that goes up to the level of neshama, and ultimately reaches God himself, who responds with mercy. The Zohar continues and describes these three levels. When the world requires mercy, these worthy righteous souls, their nefesh, which is found in this world to shield the world, rises upward, soars over the world and informs the ruach. The ruach rises upward and informs the neshama, which in turn tells God, then God has compassion on the world, and the neshama goes down and informs the ruach, and the ruach informs the nefesh. In other words, the process is reversed. Those who don't know how to communicate with the dead, how do we have them intercede on our behalf? If you know how to speak this language, then and you're a mystic, you're a Kabbalist, you know, you, know how, you know how to connect on the soul level. But what about someone like me, who isn't holding on that? level you know when we what i see is the physical the material world how do we communicate so let's read this fascinating piece from the czar rabbi chia said i wonder if there's anyone who even knows how to communicate with the dead including us rabbi abba answered the pain informs them the torah informs them when nobody knows how to communicate the torah is brought to the graves and they are aroused by the Torah's presence. And then the angel Duma, the angel responsible for the cemeteries, informs them. That was quoted from Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Yossi said, they know the world is in pain, but the living are not able to communicate it to them. Then everyone cries over the Torah being exiled to the cemetery. If people repent and cry with a pure heart and return to God, then they can all gather at beseech for mercy and inform the old ones of Hebron who will inform the spirit on Gan Eden. And now the Zohar continues with an encounter between the sages and the deceased. One day, we're on page four. One day, Rabbi Chizkiya and Rabbi Yoisi were walking. They passed Gush Cholov and it lay in ruins. They sat near the cemetery and Rabbi and Rabbi Yesa was holding part of a torn Torah scroll. And they were sitting one grave, as they were sitting, one grave began to shout, Oi! Oi! The world is in distress. The Torah has been brought here. Or the living have come to poke fun at us with their Torah. Rabbi Chizkiah and Rabbi Yesa were in shock. Who are you? asked Rabbi Chizkiah. The grave responded, I am dead, and I was aroused by the Torah scroll. 
Once the world was in distress and the living came here to arouse us with the Torah scroll. My friends and I went to Hebron, and when we connected with the spirits of the tzaddikim, it was revealed the Torah scroll was invalid since a letter Vav was added to a verse and they lied in the name of God. They said that since they lied in the name of the king, we should not respond to them and they pushed us out of the heavenly academy. So what happened was when the community came to pray at the cemetery, they brought an invalid Torah scroll with them. Why was it invalid? Because it had an extra letter in the verse Vishishas. In effect, what they did was they lied in the name of God. An invalid Torah is like a saying, a lie in the name of God. And therefore, these souls who bore the message were punished and banished from the heavenly academy. Okay? And the story doesn't end there. Then one elder brought Rabbi Hemnuna, Rabbi Hemnuna's, I'm sorry. One elder brought the Torah scroll of Rabbi Hemnuna. And Rabbi Lezer ben Shimon was aroused. He went to Gan Eden and begged for mercy upon them, and the world was healed. Then we were allowed to enter again. And that day when Rabbi Lezer was brought up from the cemetery and given his, to his father, nobody is willing to beseech before the sleepers of Hebron, for we remain scared from the day we were thrown out of the heavenly academy. Now you have come with a Torah scroll. We said among ourselves that the world must be in distress. We were worried. Who would go inform the sleepers of Hebron? In other words, we can't do it because we were, we're scared. We're afraid. We had one bad episode that happened over there. We ain't going back. The world is in trouble. What's going to happen now? Rabbi Yisa left with the Torah remnant. Rabbi Chizkiya responded, God forbid the world is not in distress. We have not come for that. Rabbi Chizkiya and Rabbi Yisa rose and departed. Certainly in the absence of living tzaddikim, the world only continues in the merit of the deceased. Now, after this encounter, the sages had a discussion among themselves. Omer Rabbi Yisra, Rabbi Yisra said, when rain is needed in the world, why do we go to the dead? What are we praying by the dead for? Doesn't the verse say, that The Torah forbids us to inquire of the dead. So Rabbi Chizkiah replied and he said, the dead over here doesn't mean, you, 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 you made a mistake, he said. The dead to whom the verse refers are those who may certainly be termed dead, meaning the sinners of the Heathians who are forever dead, but of Israel who are truly righteous. What does Shlomo HaMelech say, King Solomon says, and I praise the dead. For they are already dead, meaning they have died in the past, but now they are living. But now they are living. Furthermore, when other nations visit their dead, they come with magic to arouse evil spirits upon themselves. By contrast, when the Jews visit their dead, they come in the profuse repentance before God, with a contrite heart, and with fasting, with intent that the holy souls entreat God for mercy on their behalf, and then for their sake He has compassion on the world. So Rabbi Yassi asked a critical question. How are we allowed to pray to the dead? And what's the response? What's the answer? The answer is, we are not allowed to pray to the dead, period. We never pray to the dead. It is a prohibition of biblical proportions to pray to the dead. We pray to God. The reason why we go to the gravesite of the dead is because we ask the dead to intercede on our behalf. We can do it. Can you, my dear righteous tzaddik, intercede by God on my behalf to bring my petition before God? So when God responds, why will God respond? Not on my merit, because I'm meritless. But if you bring my petition before God, God is going to answer it on your merit. Like in any situation you can imagine, where you need something from someone and you know that this person owes me nothing in life, so why would they do it for me? On the contrary, back in the day, I one time offended them. So if I come to them and ask them for this favor right now, what's the percentage in my favor that they're going to say yes? Very little. Ah, but 
we have a very good mutual friend. And my good friend is this person's very good friend. So if I can ask my friend to ask that person the favor, ah, so then he's not responding to me. Then he's doing it as a favor to his friend. Now the percentage that they're going to re respond in kind is much, much higher. That's what we're doing. We're saying, my dear Tzaddik, you're much more friendly with God than I am. You have much more merit by God than I have. Do me a favor. I'm in trouble right now. Please, I beg of you, rise to the occasion. Bring the petition before God. That's what I ask. I don't pray to you, but I ask of you. Correct. Very, 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 exactly. And why specifically there? Because that's where the nefesh remains. Very good. In regard to this, we have learned. Sadik, a righteous man. When he departs from this world, does not truly ever depart. He does not truly depart from any world. For he is to be found in all worlds more than in his lifetime. In his lifetime, he is found only in this world. But afterwards, he is found in three worlds and accessible there. In other words, he exists without the limitations of the body. So the body is a constraint on every soul. It's on, the body is limiting my, my soul also and your soul as well. That's not unique for the tzaddik. But when you're holding the level of a tzaddik with the soul of the tzaddik, your body is a limitation to hold you to the here and the now, whereas after one what we call in English dies, but what dies, death means departure of soul from body. Well, now that tzaddik soul is ever more present in this world, able to accomplish and able to beseech of God and able to evoke God's mercy and to elicit God's blessings and to draw down God's extensions of love and kindness in a manner that is way greater than while the tzaddik was alive. So it can easily be said, as the Tanya quotes, that a tzaddik, after he dies, is found and is more present in this world than when he was alive. Fascinating idea over here. Which leads us to another fascinating idea. And that is, why are the righteous buried in the diaspora? We know that Israel is the holiest place. And we know that when there's going to be the resurrection of the dead, that Moshiach is going to come, those that dwell in Israel will rise up first. So that's why many Jews, many, many Jews ask when they die, even though they died in the diaspora, they ask to travel, take my remains with and bring it to Israel and bury me in Israel. So we have to ask the question on Moses. Why didn't Moses put in that request? Why didn't Moses say, listen, guys, God, I'm, I'm desperate to get into Israel. I beg God, 515 different prayers, I said. But at the end of the day, God told me, you're not going in. Fine. I'm going to have to die here. But after I die, you guys can bring me with you, bury me there. Why didn't he ask that? Why was he buried in the desert at an undisclosed location? Simply, guys, I know you love me. I love Israel. There would be nothing more honorable than you could do for me after I die and bring me to Israel. Um, every Jew would have raised his hand and said, I'm, I'll carry your coffin, Moses. It's a, it would be my greatest honor to be chosen to carry your coffin, Moses. I just went a couple of weeks ago to JFK Airport because unfortunately a woman in Hillcrest, Queens passed away who I knew and the body was being transported to Israel, Mozart Shabbat. Yes. So I went Mozart Shabbat to JFK Chicago area. Yep. So this is this is something that needs to be understood. Why would why wouldn't Moses make that request? So the Midrash Tanchuma, if I have it on page eight in your source sheets, the Midrash Tanchuma explains that God told Moses that he could come into the land if he so desires. But then he said, but what would then happen to the desert generation? Moses, you would be asked. You entered the land of Israel yourself, but what did you do with the 600,000 members of your nation that remained in the desert? This is why Moses remained in the desert. In other words, if someone asks you, Gary, Chaim, Yankel, Shalom, 
Why was Moses left in the desert? You know what the answer is? Because Moses wanted to remain with his people. If his people, the ones that he took out of Egypt, his generation, so to speak, were all buried in the desert, well, then that's where he would be buried. He wouldn't want to say that he deserted them. He left them behind. He made it to the promised land. Everybody else, eh. All those 600,000 people, that he left them behind. No, no, no. Therefore, the Torah says of Moses that he carried out God's righteousness and his judgment in Israel. He remained with his flock in the forsaken desert so that he would be able to ultimately take them along when he entered the land of Israel for the future redemption. The Midrash gives us a little bit of an analogy for this. And the Midrash says, this is source number six, God said to Moses, how can you demand entry into the land of Israel? It's like a shepherd who went to tend to the king's flock of sheep and the flock was stolen. The shepherd wanted to enter the king's palace. But the king said, others will say that you caused them to be stolen. So too God said to Moses, will your legacy be that you buried 600,000 people in the desert and brought a different generation into the land? Remain at their side and come with them in the future. As the verse says, he came at the head of the people. So this is a fascinating idea of why Moses is, remains in the desert. And we find this idea, correct, correct, correct. We find this idea even more powerfully, more strong in the final words of the book of Genesis. You have to remember, we all know that at the end of the book, when we finish, when we conclude a book of Torah, reading the Torah, what do we say? Chazak, chazak. We make an, a declaration of strength, right? The book of Exodus be begins with what? The book of Exodus begins with the story of slavery. Slavery in Egypt. And you got to ask yourself, we're, we're, let's examine, let's do some, 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 some examination over here. The Jews were in Egypt 210 years. Out of those 210 years, they had decades and decades of terrible torture, back-breaking labor. It was a holocaust. How did they survive? How did they do it? Where did they get the strength from? Well, let me tell you a little secret. Before we go and open up with the story of slavery in Egypt, we made a declaration that said, Chazak, Chazak, Venus Chazak. We gave a declaration of strength. We're going to be blessing you with strength. What were the final words of the book of Genesis that led us into this declaration of strength? Well, the final words of the book of Genesis was, and Joseph dies. Joseph dies. It's a verse that describes the death of Joseph. And the verse says, and, that, and the Egyptians embalmed him. And then what did they do? The final words, Vayisim ordering B'Mitzrayim. And they placed his casket in Egypt. In other words, they buried Joseph in Egypt. And what do the Jews say? Chazak, chazak, v'nis chazak. Joseph, we buried you in Egypt. Chazak, chazak, v'nis chazak. Strength. Why? How could it be? Talking about death of Joseph. How could it be? Ah, it was on purpose. Because it's from Joseph that the Jewish people would lean their strength. Joseph, after he dies, remains in Egypt. He says to them, we're going to have rough days ahead, but I promise you, God is going to get us out. There's going to be a redeemer. And when their redemption happens, take me with you. When all the Jews go out, you'll take me with you. But as long as you're still here, says Joseph, I'm going to remain with you over here. I'm not going to be like Jacob who said, Bring me back. No. Jacob, that was his service. But this is my people. Joseph, I'm responsible for bringing you down to Egypt. And I'm not going to forsake you. I am going to remain with you. And from there, the Jews always knew that we have a place to turn to, Joseph. And we have a promise that we're going to be redeemed from Joseph and we will take him out together with us. This was the chizuk, as we say. This is the greatest form of encouragement and strength that the Jewish people were given in the exile. So th this is all coming together over here. You see this fascinating ideas of how 
tzaddikim righteous, even after they are living in the physical world, tangible, where you can see their flesh and blood, when they only remain on a soul level because their bodies have been buried, nevertheless, the soul impacts the world and influences the world in an even greater measure than when they are alive. And we see this, Rachel, Yosef, Moshe, you see this throughout history. When it comes to when it comes to this idea, we have to mention what the Rebbe said. You turn to page eleven. The Rebbe explained why, on the fourth anniversary of his father-in-law's passing, the same is true of every Jewish leader in his generation. A Jewish leader disregards his own spiritual desires for the sake of his people. When his people remain in exile. He remains in exile with them to continue being a source of blessing and connection through which his flock can connect with God. During, what is the life of a Rebbe? What's the job of a Rebbe? What's the role of a Rebbe? The role of a Rebbe is to connect every Jew with Almighty God. We're already connected. But the Rebbe exposes that connection for us. Brings it to the fore. Removes any dirt that's covering this bright light. That's the job of a Rebbe. That's what a Rebbe is. And that job remains after his life as well. Because on a soul level, he can expose on your connection with God. Vizel, and this will explain why Chabad Rebbe's were laid to rest in the diaspora. They wanted to remain with their flock to be a source of assistance to them. They possess general souls. It's called the Neshama Klolis in Kabbalah, which are the source of all the individual souls of their generation. So they have the power to help individuals, being that every person is a part of them far more than ordinary people. So it's the, 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 the Rebbe's soul is in the Shoma Klolis. It's like the brain of the body. If we would divide all the Jewish souls into body parts, so the Neshama of the Tzaddik and the Sihadur, the leader of the generation, is like the brain, the muscle that generates all necessary powers for the entire body. It directs the body. Etc., etc., etc. It sustains the rest of the body. That's the job of the Nasi, the, the leader of the generation, is to sustain and nourish Jews in his generation, materially and spiritually, to be a sustainer and a feeder of faith for his people. As we're one week before Gimel Tammuz, the leader of our generation, with the Rebbe, we saw this greater than any previous generation because recorded. We have this recorded. Previous leaders didn't have it recorded. There was no way of recording. You know, video and testimonials and books didn't exist. But now we have the printed press. Now we have people, living people, able to give living testimony, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In one of the most fascinating stories, the story is fascinating on a number of levels. We're going to read it right now. But we're going to read it for a specific reason. To get the point, and that the point is to read a letter that the Rebbe wrote. But in order to appreciate the letter, you have to first understand the background. Okay? Do you guys have the story of the small Jew of the Caribbean? You have it? So, Gary, huh? Yeah, page 12. Yeah. yeah. Eli Groisman recalls. You have that? Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. So here's the background to the story. Here's the background to the story. Okay. This background to the story is like this There was a gentleman, his name is Ellie Grossman, Eli Grossman. He grew up in Curacao. I think that's how you pronounce it. Curacao, which is a Caribbean island, which is, mm -hmm. yes, which is part of the Netherlands Antilles, however you pronounce that word. Antilles, yes, used okay. to be. Now, yeah. That's where he grew up. There were no Jewish schools on the island at the time, and he attended a Protestant school. He had a very difficult time at school. He was not brought up in an observant home, but nevertheless, he stubbornly refused to participate in the religious services that the rest of his class were participating and in the rest of the religious curriculum that was being taught. Non Jewish students would pick fights with him on a daily basis. 
And he always felt that his teachers and his, even his principal would always take their side. So this is the one, one lone Jewish boy who was in a Protestant school who was being fed information he doesn't want to be, have any part of. He's being bullied. He's being beaten. And, he's, it's, and from his perspective, it seems like all the staff at the school are against him. When he reached the seventh grade, things were really coming to a head. Life was getting only more difficult for him. The fights were getting bigger and more nasty. And his relationship with the principals and the teachers were becoming more and more hostile. So he came up with a plan, and his plan was he would be, skip school. So he would get dropped off at school. And then instead of going to school, he would go to the nearby golf club, uh, whatever it's called. And uh, he would play golf at the golf club over there. He would come back in time to be picked up. His father picked him up from school, and his father didn't know anything. This was going on for a couple of weeks. One day the principal calls up his father and the principal says, come down for a meeting in the office. His father goes down. His principal says, is everything okay? Like, then how come your child didn't show up to school for two weeks? <laughs> what, what, what do you mean my child didn't show up to school for two weeks? So his father goes over to him and says, how was school today? When he picked him up, how was school today? So the young boy, he figured to himself, be a little wise, he said, the same as always. Good answer. Good question, good answer. So his father says, did you go to school today? Did you go to school last week? Did you go to school two weeks ago? So the boy didn't want to lie to his father. So he's honest. He said, no, I didn't. So his father gave him a choice. The choice was like this. He said, my dear boy, either you give in and you do exactly what all the rest of the boys are doing, or you leave school and you come to work for me. What do you think the boy said? Thank you very much. He walked into school with all of his books, went to the principal's office, put it on the principal's desk, and walked out of school and told his dad, I'm going to be working for you full time. Father said, you're going to be working hard. It's not going to be easy. He didn't, he, he didn't care. He was out of school. Letters started coming to his parents' house with all the laws that minors have to go to school. It's not, you're not allowed to homeschool. All, all the legalities and pressure and his family's relationship with the rest of the community began to sour as a result of this boy's decisions. So the father is terribly upset at the situation, but he doesn't see any way out. One night, his father has a dream. In the dream, he sees himself at the age of three years old before his Absharnish. So if you're familiar with the Absharnish, yeah, yeah. Right, we don't cut the boy's hair for the first three years. The first time we cut it, it's called an upshanish. First haircut the boy gets at the age of three is an upshanish. So the father sees himself in a vision right before his upshanish, sitting on his grandmother's lap. That's the dream that he has. And she says to him in the dream, she says, "Leave you. Anytime you're in trouble, the one person who can help you is the Labavitcher Rebbe." Now. His father never heard of Lubavitcher Rebbe in his life. He, you know, what do you talk? This is the dream. He hears, he has a vision. His grandmother telling him, my dear loved one, anytime you're in trouble, the person you turn to is the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He has no idea what this means. The next morning, his father went to the synagogue. The synagogue was a very small uh, a, a, a building which was nearby his house. And his father asked the caretaker to unlock the door for him. He went over to the Holy Ark and he poured out his heart to God and he turned to leave the synagogue. What do you do? He didn't know what to do. He has the dream. The Baba Chirebi didn't know what, what, who, what, what does that mean? He's Jewish. He's in trouble. He goes to the synagogue. Please open it for me. Opens the Ark prays his soul out, closes the ark, and walks out of the synagogue. Now, there's a whole other scene going on, and that's going on in Brooklyn, New York. And here's the story. It was January 1984. Rabbi Moshe Kalarski, who just passed away three weeks ago, just, just less than a month ago, one, one month since his passing will be coming up in a few days. He was an assistant helper to the Rebbe's chief secretary, Rabbi Chadakov, of blessed memory. 
So Rabbi Kudlarski receives a telephone call in his hands. Rabbi Chadikov is on the line. And he says, wash your hands. This was code language that he understood, which meant that the Rebbe was on the phone as well. Okay. And he instructs Rabbi Kudlarski, the Rebbe would like you to go to Karasau immediately. Okay. Whenever the Rebbe tells a chassid that he wants him to go somewhere immediately, of course the chassid says, yes, I will do it. He grabs a companion, finds a 17-year-old Rabbi Levi Krinsky, wasn't a rabbi then, young teenager. He says, come with me on this journey. I have no idea what I'm doing there. I don't know what we're going for. I don't know anything. The Rebbe said we got to go to Karasau. So they take the next flight to Karasau. They arrive at the airport and they don't know what they're supposed to do. What are you supposed to do? They hop into a taxi and they tell the taxi driver, what do you think he tells the taxi driver? He says, bring me to the local synagogue. And Rabbi Kalar, what do you want? Bring me to the local shul? So now, in Karasau, there is a big synagogue, from what I understand, there's a big synagogue that's a part of the museum that people go and they tour and they visit. It's a whole, the history of the Jewish community there. But it's not really functional, the synagogue, especially not, not during an average day. The taxi driver, instead of taking Rabbi Kalarski to the synagogue, for some odd reason, decides to take the, the uh, Rabbi Kalarski and Krinsky to the small neighborhood shul, the small little shul on the block that uh, no one even knows about. They pull up in the taxi. Rabbi Kalarski sees there's a gentleman walking out of the building of the shul. So he turns to the gentleman and he tells him, we were sent here by the Lubavitcher Rebbe and we would like to get to know the Jewish people here. We're staying at the Plaza Hotel. Can you come with us and tell us about the local Jewish community? Who was the man that walked out of the shul? Ellie's father. Ellie's father just walked out of the shul at that moment. And he nearly faints. He just had a dream about his grandmother. And here a guy rolls in from Brooklyn and tells him, we were sent here by the Lubavitcher. They don't even know why they were here. We were sent here by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. We would like to get to know the Jewish community. Can you come with us to our hotel and tell us about the Jewish community over here? Of course, he said yes. He goes with Kolarski to the hotel. And he tells him about his whole family plight that he has. He goes... And he tells them the whole story, what, what their family was living through at that time. And now Ellie turns to him and he says like this, I turned to Rabbi Kolarski and I said, are you allowed to defend yourself if someone comes and punches you? Are you allowed to defend yourselves? He said, he formed an impression that from, from watching different movies and television shows, that the Jews in the Holocaust were weak and they didn't fight back when they were attacked. So Rabbi Kalarski responds to him and says, you make sure that you defend yourself and do as much damage as you can to make sure that they don't come back to you and hurt you ever again. And he thought this was so, so cool. Rabbi Kalarski in that conversation invites him to go to New York and attend Gan Yisrael overnight camp in the Catskill Mountains for the summer and later go to Yeshiva in September. This was the answer to all of his prayers. And he accepted the offer immediately. Now, he concludes by saying, when he says the story, that he, he, he wants to thank the Rebbe for taking care of him and his family. And you, we could all take an example from the Rebbe of how one should care for their fellow Jew. It doesn't matter where their fellow Jew is. It doesn't matter how observant or how knowledgeable their fellow Jew is. It can be someone... Far away, it could be someone that lives around the corner or even down the hall in your same building. If we all follow the Rebbe's way of living, the Rebbe's care for every Jew, Mashiach will come. Now, why, why are we sharing this story right now? This is the background to the letter. He wrote a letter to the Rebbe thanking him for everything that he did for him. Let's read, Gary, let's read source 8. The response that he received from the Lubavitch Rebbe, the third of Nisan, in 5744, this is approximately April 1984. Okay? 
free and blessed. I was pleased to receive your regards to our, our esteemed mutual friends. I must, however, take exception to your referring, referring to yourself as a small Jew from Kurokov. Okay. So, you guys here online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, continue. There is surely no need to emphasize to you at length that every Jew, man or woman, has the nefesh, a locus, which is a part of godliness above, as explained in the Tanya, beginning of chapter two. Thus, there is no such thing as a small Jew, and a Jew must never underestimate his or her tremendous potential. With the approach of the Yom Tov Pesach, I take this opportunity of extending to you my prayerful wishes that the festival of our freedom bring you and yours true freedom, freedom from anxiety, material, and spiritual, from anything which might distract from serving God wholeheartedly and with joy, and to carry over this, this freedom and joy into the whole year, wishing you and yours a kosher and happy Pesach with blessing and shiasi. So he wrote to the Rebbe, thank you for taking care of a small Jew from Curtis. Respond to him. Thing as a small Jew. And a Jew must never underestimate his or her tremendous potential. This was the Rebbe. This is how the Rebbe looked at every Jew. This Rebbe is Rebbe's care and love for every single Jew. That's why we turn and we ask the Rebbe, because we know that the Rebbe in his lifetime cared for every Jew. So whatever he did in his lifetime is only more powerful when the, when the neshama, when the soul doesn't have the limitations of the body. One final moment, one final word. That is, so why do we have, they build a tent, a, 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 a ohel around the Rebbe's, the grave. And it's not for the, we don't, the Rebbe writes, the Rebbe, the, 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 the good deeds of the righteous are their monument. They don't need a marble stone for anyone to know what they did. They have generations of people talk about what they did in life and the impact that they had. They don't need a marble stone. The reason why we go to the oil and the reason why the oil is, is built the way it is with walls surrounding it is so you should walk into a chamber where you feel that you are walking into the Rebbe's presence right now. That's why it should be surrounded with walls so that you can walk into the Rebbe's space, so to speak. This is where the Rebbe is and we're walking into that space right now. It's not for him, it's for you. When you look, when you read what it says on the money, when you walk into this is a physical reminder to your physical eyes, which affects you and how you think, to be conscious of the space where you are right now. So this is a background to why Jews from around the world pray for millennia, for our own his whole entire history at the graveside of the righteous. It gives us a little bit of snippet of what the Zohar, how the Zohar describes the process of what takes place, how it's a soul connection, my soul to the nefesh of the tzaddik, which remains over there. And if the tzaddik cares for you in his lifetime, if you consider part of the tzaddik's generation, the tzaddik cares for you after. The tzaddik will intercede on your behalf. We don't pray to the tzaddik. We ask of the tzaddik to help us in our desperate situation to bring our petition before God so that God respond to us with his mercy, with his grace and his kindness to give us whatever it is that we need. In family life, in livelihood, in our sustenance, in our food, in our good health, everything should be tip-top shape, the best of the best, in abundance from God's abundant and overflowing righteous and holy hand. May we all merit to receive, to receive God's blessings in a revealed way, and a good which is visible to our own flesh and eyes. Anyone have any questions on today's lesson? Perfect.